Now, creating a taxonomy, I think, is actually a pretty creative process. So this is by no means the only way to do something. Um, and I would actually really encourage you, if you do make taxonomies, please leave in the comments below, what other things did I miss? How do you do this? I'm really curious. I know a lot of people on LinkedIn were excited to see this series show up because they do it, but they don't know how anybody else does it. So I'm not saying the way that I'm doing it is the perfect way or the only way, but I know from experience, having somebody tell you how they do something, especially when it comes to taxonomy, where not everybody has you know, the ability to talk about what they've done um, or how they do it, I know I would have really appreciated having something like this when I was first starting out. Right now, you should see Protege on your screen. This is a free tool. You can go and download it. Uh, this is the desktop version. There's also a web version that we're going to be using in the live demonstration on the 22nd of August. Um, but for this demonstration, I just wanted to keep it simple. So I always start with the provenance. You don't wanna forget about that for your vocabulary. So here I have the IRI, which is essentially like if I wanted to make this taxonomy available online, I could do it through this link. And I could also have this as a pointer to just internal systems if I was doing that as well. Um, I also have a version, I have this as 0.01 because there's already a much larger version of this on Web Protege that we're gonna be working with. So here I've got the audience. So this is the user persona. Again, this is for the Smithsonian patron who is seeking specific kinds of jewelry on the website. Um, this was created in August and it was created by me. And you can see that I am using DC uh, as the schema for that metadata. So let's go and start to look at what to add into Protege itself as terms go. So what I do is for step one is I go through my corpus of assets. And as I'm going through this corpus, and you're going to see it's the Smithsonian here, this is really what you're going to be spending your time on. So if you have automated ways of going through and mining terminology from the descriptions, I prefer doing a k-means cluster analysis when I'm doing that. If you don't have the mechanism to do that, you're going to have to do it by hand, or you can do other machine learning techniques uh, to do this. For this demonstration, I'm just going to be doing something very simple. So I'm not going to do the machine learning piece, um, but of course we can talk about that in another video. So what you're doing is you're just going through and seeing how each of these things is described and you're putting all that clay on the table. So as you're going through and you're looking at the different terminology that's being picked up, you're going to start to do the clustering. So gathering things that have similar characteristics and putting a label or a category on those things and seeing how they logically are represented. Again, at some point you might find that you don't want to structure it logically. This is something that um, I'm not a huge fan of, but if, you know, for instance, if you're doing something on this, this collection and you know the Arthur Peabody, making that up, uh, collection is highly sought after, maybe you have a whole part of the taxonomy just dedicated to that. That's not necessarily logical. That's more what I call a functional um, part of the vocabulary. Again, the whole thing is functional, but this is just the words that I use to describe the two things. But sometimes when you're looking at your use case and your users, there might be um, extraneous circumstances to go outside of logical, which is this is a child of this, and this is logically how these things are grouped together to more of a highlight and user specific type of, of taxonomy. You can mix and match these two things. But again, I tend to stay away from doing the user focused one because it's very hard to then update it. Um, you're really focusing on maybe just a certain subtype of um, user. And oftentimes it probably means that the user interface itself is not showing the user what they want right away. And so they're having to like filter or search for it. So instead of doing the specialized, you know, way of doing the taxonomy, I would just go talk to your UX designers and try to find a way of, of meeting the needs that way. Okay, so I'm going to show you three examples, three, three, three examples of um, going through different products 
in this collection and starting to gather some terminology. It's going to be very brief because this is a very brief exercise. We are going to have many more videos talking about each of these aspects, some of the trials and tribulations, um, but I wanted to make sure that for those that are going to be um, in the class on the 22nd, that you have um, a, a very lightweight introduction to this if you haven't done this already. Okay, so let's go in and look at the Blue Heart Diamond. Okay, so the title is there. We've got locality and we've got weight and we've got a description. You see what I just did? I went through and I looked at the metadata that is there. Now I'm using the interface, the public interface to do this. Of course, if you have access to the backend databases, use that, but I don't have um, the backend database for this. So I first start to look at what is um, the controlled fields that they have um, to see if I can get anything from that. I'm checking to see if there's any tags already. Doesn't look like there are. Um, usually the way that search engines look at the importance of something is um, the subjects or the tags, the title, looking at the description, and usually like the author or creator of something. So here, the title is Blue Heart Diamond. So blue indicates that I'm going to need colors. Heart indicates I'm going to need shapes. And diamond indicates I'm going to need gemstones. The other thing is diamonds can also be a shape. So this tells me I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with terms that have different contexts in my vocabulary. So let's go ahead and add these to protege. Okay, so let's go ahead and add blue. You can see it's adding like this. Diamond and heart. Oops, didn't mean to put heart there. So you just drag and drop and it corrects. Okay, so I don't have enough information to really kind of start grouping these together. Although logically I can look at these and say one is a color, one is a shape, and one is a gemstone. Well, let's see what else we can get from this. Okay, so catalog number. Um, I can't do much with a catalog number. Locality, okay, locality is good. Let's add locality. So locality seems to be more of a category. And what was the locality? South Africa, okay. So right now we don't know if this content has different um, subcategories. So I'm just going to add this as South, oops, South Africa. Okay, so you can see when I added South Africa as a subclass, it actually added it over here automatically. This is why you really want to graduate from an Excel sheet into something more structured and machine readable because it will help you with shortcuts so that it helps you get farther. You will also notice that I'm putting the label in here. That's not normally what you wanna do. Normally you would wanna have the unique ID over here and then over here in the annotations you would add label and you would add in And you would say, this is English. And you can see that. So that's normally how you would do it. But because this is a demonstration, I am putting the labels over here. But just keep in mind, these should be the unique IDs. Because you see how I have it highlighted. You can see me pointing. <laughs> um, you see how I have it highlighted here? How it actually shows up with the URI? That's why you want that to be an ID. So that wherever this shows up in, in linking and, and using it, um, that it is accurate and it's not dependent on the label. Remember we talked about that. IDs, IDs, IDs don't function off the label. I'm only doing it here so that you can see it easily. Okay, so we've got South Africa. Let's go in and we can see that it's a gift of Mrs. Marjorie Post. Okay, so this is a person. Um, when you have a taxonomy that includes people. It's usually this thing is about that person created 
by that person or is somehow related to that person. In this case, it was donated by. So in my opinion, this should be a uh, controlled field. Obviously, they didn't do that. So if I felt that the users would want to find everything else that Miss Marjorie Post has given to the museum, I would add that to the taxonomy. If I knew that people would be searching for this, I would add it to the taxonomy. If I knew that people um, would want recommendations um, based on this data, I would add it to my taxonomy. Right now, I'm going to keep it simplistic, so I'm not gonna add it to my taxonomy, but I would probably add this under a category like donor. Okay, so you can also go through and mine for more things from this description. I would definitely do this if I was doing this on my own time, but I am not, I'm doing it on your time, so I'm not going to do that. I just wanna make another note that weight is in here, and while weights, specifically like this are usually not in a taxonomy. If this is an important piece of data that you feel that your user or your backend systems will want um, to be able to filter or do something smart with, I would suggest doing it in ranges so you can actually um, control um, what these are going to, to look like on the backend and not just have a, every single type of weight as a term because that's not great. Okay, so let's go look at another one. Let's look at this one, it's aquamarine. So this is the Dom Pedro aquamarine. So I don't know what Dom Pedro means, but I know aquamarine is a type of gemstone. So let's go back and we can see, okay, well, we have another type of gemstone. Oh, great. That means those are similar. They have similar characteristics. That means they might be a category. Don't be afraid of making categories, mixing and matching, getting it wrong. It's okay. You're going to do lots of user testing, lots of search testing. You're gonna have SMEs looking at this. Your mistakes will get ironed out. So I just wanna make sure, you know, I hear a lot of new students that I teach whether you're in your career, you've been doing this forever, I would just encourage you, don't, don't find yourself getting frozen because you don't wanna make a mistake when you're making a taxonomy. Make lots of mistakes. Just don't put it out to the public until you've figured out what those are. Here, we're seeing that gemstones is a thing that we wanna add as a category. So gemstone, okay. Now we're going to grab diamond. See how I'm just dragging it up. Again, nice. You don't have to mess around with an Excel sheet because of this. Um, and then we're gonna add another subclass of aquamarine. You can see this is the IRI that's being created right here. So this is why you, again, want an ID. Okay, so aquamarine is also a color. And depending on how I wanna function in this taxonomy later down the road, is aquamarine a type of blue or is it a color all by itself? These are some of the questions you're gonna to have to ask yourself. Colors are kind of tricky. So you can have colors represented by their labels. You can have colors represented by the hex code or the RGB code. There's lots of different words for different colors. Again, if you're doing something that's just for browsing, you might want to decide what the MVP colors are and then just bundle the rest into um, other, which is not a great idea, but if you're just doing it for browse, you might be okay with it um, or having a multicolor. Because remember, you don't want to add a term unless you have a significant amount of content for it. So if you have one article of something, maybe you don't need to use that in your taxonomy. Maybe you do, you need to decide that, but. Chances are if you only have one of something in a sea of other things, if it's not significant, then leave it out. You can always go back and add it later if you get more content on it. That's why taxonomies are living, breathing data sets. You should go back and you should look at how often you get new content or new assets in or out and then reevaluate what ver verbiage you have in your taxonomy at that time. So we've got it's aquamarine, Locality, oh, okay, so this is interesting. Now we have, so 
What this means is now we have more specificity, so we have to make a decision. Are we going to keep it only at the country level, or is it important enough to us to have it at the um, individual city, which is what this is? And because this is Smithsonian and these are mostly geological, these gemstones are from specific areas and the um, soil composition and um, natural elements actually go into uh, making these, I would say that it is important. So let's add it. So we've got Minas Gerais and we've got Brazil. Okay, so right now we don't have anything under, under locality other than you know, an instance. So now we would probably want to make some subclasses. We've got South Africa and Brazil. Those are countries. A little cluster happening there. So country. And we're going to put South Africa under country. And we're going to add Brazil because we just found that one. And now remember, we also saw a city. So let's add city. I'm gonna have a subclass. Whoops, don't want all that. There we go. Okay, so now you can see your taxonomy coming together. Let's go back. Oh, okay, so um, it is a barrel. That's a type of gemstone. Okay, so let's add that in. We already have other gemstones. You have to make a decision whether all the cases are going to be caps or not, and whether your taxonomy is going to be singular versus plural. Um, I know some people just insist because these are classes, remember the universal um, description of a diamond, that it should be diamonds because it's including all diamonds under the planet. Um, I would agree with that, but I'm not a stickler for it. Um, I think it depends on what your use case is. All right, let's see what else do we have here? Actually, this is a really great description of barrel. So again, you would want to check copyright before you do this. So I'm going to copy it. I'm going to add over here. DC des description, okay, that's the schema label that we're going to use. I'm going to put that long thing in, and then I'm going to say this came from Smithsonian website 08-2020. Okay, so you'll notice that I just put in something like a citation. Again, this is not structured. Ideally, you would have that structured. Um, I'm not doing that right now, but I'm just saying definitely make that structured. Um, even when it is structured though, I do tend to put like this, where did this description come from when it's descriptions? Because people are usually reading those descriptions and they like to know where they came from. Um, but if you are going to be using it for machine learning, leave that citation out. Okay, so did all that. I indicate it's in English and I say, okay, and you can see this is my now description, which is great. Okay, so let's keep going. Again, I would go through all of this and get more. I would, I would really suck up all the data in all of these, but for now, I'm just gonna skip ahead. What's uh, this thing, what's this thing? Okay, so Conchita Montana Sapphire Butterfly. Okay, so we've got Montana. I don't know where con what Conchita means yet. So let's add Montana. Oh, we don't have a state yet. Um, again, I would wait to see if I had more states, but for now I'm going to put it in because I skipped ahead. I already know there's states. <laughs> so we're gonna add this as state, and then we're going to add Montana. Okay. And what did it say? Sapphire and butterfly. So sapphire is a gemstone. Butterfly. So that's a shape. Is it a shape or an animal though? That's where you would have to make another decision. 
if there are enough things in your collection that are shaped like an animal, you may want to have under shape or even have its own category is animals, depictions of animals, it should say, instead of just animals. Um, because an animal is the actual thing, a depiction of is that animal in art or jewelry or um, a representation. We don't have anything for shape yet, so let's make that as a category here. Shape. And heart was a shape. And butterfly. So you see blue is hanging out, that's not good. So whether you handle it at the very end of your process or as you go, um, this is called an orphan. It's kind of all by itself, it's kind of floating out there. You wanna make sure you go in and add um, a home for this. And so I'm just gonna make this color, spelling it the US way, sorry. Whoops, that's not what I wanted, there we go. And there we go. Okay, now we've got the color blue. Now remember, aquamarine is also a color. And so is sapphire. And diamonds are shapes. What do we do? Do we make another term? No, we do not. That would be bad. So the reason for that is um, quite often people, when they have a poly hierarchy, they try to make that same term and they just duplicate it everywhere it's supposed to belong. It's not great to do that because that bloats your taxonomy. It makes it much harder to maintain. It makes searching on it really hard. So this is what you do. This is why unique identifiers, UIDs are so amazing. So these are supposed to be IDs. Remember, these are not the labels. These are, these are the IDs. So if diamond was ID one, two, three, four. Okay, so shape. So if I wanted to add diamond to shape, you'll see that these are subclasses of diamond. So I would go to diamond and I would, and see how it only has a subclass gemstone. I'm gonna add another subclass. And it's really nice because you can see the taxonomy right here. So I'm going to also say that it is a subclass of shape. So if I go up to shape, you can see it's now in shape, but this is the same term. Okay, so let's go, let's go to this diamond and let's add some metadata to see how this works. Um, so we're gonna put in the label, there we go. Alt label um, for diamond. Uh, let's, so alt label is like the use for synonym. Let's see, um, let's, let's be funny. Girl's best friend. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Madonna, yes. Okay, girl's best friend, that's in English. Okay, so we added that as an alt label to diamond under gemstone. Now let's go look at this diamond. Ha, it still has the same metadata. And why is that? Because it is the same concept, which is good. So now let's go do that for the other ones we were talking about. So a sapphire. Remember, sapphire is also a color, so let's say color. And aquamarine is also a color. And now let's go look, where's our colors? And our colors, see, now you can see them in here. It's beautiful, right? This is all how linking works. This is a better way of doing a poly hierarchy. Um, we won't go into it in this video, but there is a tool in web project called Inference where it can actually help you identify when you have circular logic. That's one of the most common problems with poly hierarchies is where you say something is a child of something is a child of something and it kind of all refers back to each other. So that's not good logic. You don't have to have a poly hierarchy. You can have a mono hierarchy where it's just every class is distinct and it is never gonna be found anywhere else. Try not to let your taxonomy overcompensate for all of your other UI stuff or all of your other machine learning things and, and your search engine. It is very useful, it is very powerful, but it should not solve all problems. In fact, it can create problems if you're trying to solve 
for those problems with your taxonomy. So pre versus post coordination. So pre coordination means that you are pre selecting which terms go together. These are usually used when terms have to be standalone. So the Library of Congress uh, subject headings do this a lot. They do limit, in my opinion, what you can do with a taxonomy. If you're only using your taxonomy for browsing, it makes sense because you just need, you know, that point blank, this thing is where all the sapphire butterflies are. That's perfectly acceptable. On the search side, however, it really limits what you can do because when somebody is doing a keyword search, they don't necessarily know sapphire and butterfly are always together. Maybe they put in butterflies that are blue. Okay, well, if your, your subject is sapphire butterfly and you haven't mapped that distinct concept to the color blue and sapphire and all these other things, you're not going to be able to help that, that user very well. So post-coordination means that the concepts are connected in the indexing process. So what that means is sapphire would be its own concept and butterfly would be its own concept. And when indexing, you would put them together and say sapphire butterflies as two distinct tags um, when you are in, um, describing what this thing is about. And the reason you do that is because all that rich metadata on sapphire being blue, being a gemstone, all these other things are all contained in there. And same with butterfly. So you get all that richness with both of them. And it also makes sure that you don't have, what about a topaz butterfly and an orange butterfly and a peridot butterfly. And a, you can see where I'm going with this. Having pre-coordination um, also tends to bloat your vocabulary because you have to basically make a separate instance, a separate um, tag for every combination that you could possibly think of. When really having them as separate and then letting the search engine join them together or the indexing join them together when needed to help the user, you get infinite possibilities. Let's say you have your vocabulary and it's starting to really shape up. Now you have to think about did you need multilingual? We can go in and we can say alt label. Again, this is SCOS. This is the schema that has a lot of things for vocabs. Uh, so blue also means azure. And then it's not English. It is Spanish. There we go. Okay, so now this is machine readable. So if I exported this and I put this into a search engine, it will know to basically do a lookup on blue and then it would see Azure. So if somebody typed in Azure, it would know it means blue and it would then return anything that was tagged with blue. Um, a few other things to just keep in mind, different terminology will change over the years. So you can put in scope notes, you can put in when a term was used or when it was sunset, all of that can be in your metadata here. The top ones I would say are, are really mandatory. A unique ID, and that's unique across all your databases, all of your collection, as well as the label. I would also say that a, a very close runner up is a description, but I also understand it's very hard to get a description for everything. So um, with that, what you would then do from this point on is you would go through the rest of this collection. Um, you would be, you know, scraping. You can either use a web scraper. You can use APIs to gather terms from other vocabularies. Um, you can see here, I went to JTV for this one. Um, it's got all kinds of data about gemstones. So I can go and I look at this and then I can look at my collection and see what things overlap um, to see if I want to add those. Just always make sure you go back to your collection, your content, your content, your content. That's why you're making a taxonomy. That's what your taxonomy has to serve. So if it's not described as something that you have, don't add it. Don't be scared to make mistakes. It's really just a process. And when I said it was creative, it really is. You have to think about this. Um, as, as if you're taking a big 
you know, pile of clay on the table and you're making something beautiful out of it. You just don't always know what it is at first. If you've ever heard of anybody that does like wood carving or even stone carving, they always say that they they look at the clay and they can already see. They they look at the wood and they can already see what it should be. And it's kind of what you do with a taxonomy. You kind of understand like the general shape of what something is going to look like. And then as you're whittling down, as you're gathering more resources, you're shaping it into what it should be. Okay. With all of that, we're going to get into way more things, a lot more specificity. I am trying to do one of these create a taxonomy videos for um, a lot of different disciplines and domains. So if you have one you want me to start with um, first, put it in the comments below. And with that, I want to thank you. Check you out next time.